Jay Dyer of Jay's Analysis. And today I want to talk about the uh, solar eclipse, mass religious deception, and some of the history of the way that the state, the way that the deep state cults have utilized religious deception, the idea of signs and wonders events to dupe the public, to corral them and control them, and to maybe even distract them from authentic Christianity, from the, the real authentic religious experience that's out there, utilizing a lot of tricks, a lot of scams, and a lot of skullduggery. We go back to the early days of the Christian church after the apostles and their death. The church, as you guys know, is persecuted by the Roman Empire. And I'm not going to be talking a whole lot about um, deep theological stuff. I do want to talk a little bit about it because it's going to relate to where we are today and the commonalities amongst odd groups, cults, and sects that are the source oftentimes for the delusions that most people believe in the religious sphere, including in the so-called Christian sphere. In the early days of the church, when the Roman Empire was per persecuting it for the first three centuries, there were, at least as far as we know, many, many, many countless martyrs. At the same time, though, there was a lot of groups that sprang up that had a lot of odd, bizarre beliefs that were contrary to the doctrine of the teaching of the apostles that was handed down. A lot of these groups uh, believed in esoteric uh, things like the Gnostics. There wasn't one Gnostic group. There was a whole myriad of Gnostic groups. And if we read the text, a uh, well-known text from St. Irenaeus of Lyon, written in about 180, called Against Heresies, the first two or 300 pages of that book is actually detailing all of the Gnostic sects that he was aware of by 180 AD. Now, he was a bishop uh, in the Orthodox Church of that time, and so he's our earliest witness to this myriad of cults. The amazing thing about the Gnostic sects and, and cults of that time is that many of the beliefs that they had then still are present today. I don't think there's like one group that survived, but a lot of the errors, a lot of the mistakes that they held to, such as the idea that the created world is inherently evil, that it was created by a Gnostic demiurge, that we need to escape the creation, or perhaps we need to embrace degeneracy. There's all kinds of different Gnostic groups and sects. Some were very uh, austere, kind of like Brahmins almost, uh, mandating no marriage, mandating not eating meat, veganism, these kinds of things, all the way to the opposite extreme of groups that believed in full and total indulgence. And <clears throat> right around that same time, we had the rise of a group called the Montanists, and Montanus was the, according to his own claims, the voice of the Holy Spirit. He said that he was really the new uh, oracle and that we didn't really need the scriptures so much. They might have a relevance, but the voice of the Holy Spirit was now this living, guiding oracle man, Montanus. And he actually drew quite a few followers away. And he ended up being the first so-called charismatic or maybe kind of Pentecostal that you could think of in the early church. Other groups arose like the Arians, not Arian like a neo-Nazi, but Arian in the sense of A-R-I-A-N, who believed that Jesus was the first thing that God created, the foundation of the world, the, the Son of God being uh, an early, early pre-eternal creation. And since Jesus was a creature, he couldn't be divine, he couldn't be worshiped, he couldn't be a real savior in any uh, significant sense. He was more of a moral example. But the Arians uh, were not just a, an odd, random political, or excuse me, uh, a theological opinion. They were actually a group promoted by certain members of the state. And the reason that the state has always preferred, in many cases, not always, but in many cases, preferred certain heresies, is because they make the state kind of a de facto god. So a lot of heresies, believe it or not, are actually useful to the state. Not all of them. Sometimes there are heresies that arise that are contrary to the state and they have to be suppressed. But sometimes heresies are very useful, cults, groups, sects. And the Imperium or the, the state, if they're smart enough, they might try to use them, co-opt them, and spin them to their own designs. And we're going to look at a few of those examples as we progress through this discussion today. As we move into uh, the, the permeation of the Roman Empire by the Christian Church, we see uh, less and less of the kind of wilder sects, and we get more and more of these kind of specified sects that focus on uh, disputes about the Trinity or disputes about who the person of Jesus is. And this is around the time, as we get up into the 5th, 6th, 7th century, we get the rise of a new cult 
that takes over a large portion of the Middle East and other places, and that's Islam. And Islam is a, 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 a mix, you could say, of a lot of different ideas, uh, even according to the Oxford Handbook of Islam. Many of the early church fathers who, say, John of Damascus, uh, who wrote in the days of the rise of Islam, they accuse it of being a mix of Nestorian forms of so-called Christianity, Arian forms of Christianity, latent uh, Arab paganism, as well as Jewish traditions, Talmudic traditions, and pseudepigraphic Christian traditions. So Islam is a sort of odd mix of all of these things, and that's, I think, one reason why it's very confusing to a lot of people. And so in the case of Islam, we get the first uh, uh, widespread, large-scale rejection of the notion of Christ as the Son of God. In Islam, Allah has no sons, can have no sons. Allah is a master and you are a slave. You are not a son of God. That's a totally different, <clears throat> that's a different idea. So in Islam, uh, we get this marked turn away from even the earlier forms of Christianity that were heterodox or pseudo-Christianity like Arianism. We get a more warrior spirit, a more uh, radical idea of what John in his epistles calls Antichrist. John says that if any man denies the Logos in the flesh, that the Son of God has come in the flesh, he says that is the spirit of Antichrist. And so Islam is a uh, an Antichrist movement, even though it might recognize Jesus as a nice man or a prophet or something like this. Really, it doesn't matter because that's not what is necessary. What's necessary, as Jesus says in uh, John 7, 8, 9, is that he's the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, he ha is the Son of God. Uh, he's the only way. So this religious movement, other scholars argue, it's not just a mix of kind of early heresies. There were, there were also powerful state figures. Eventually, you get sheikhs, you get sultans who realize the power of this religion, this, this newly created, uh, what we say is a schism or heresy of Islam, to, to be used by the state. And in my view, that's why you get, for example, the burning and uh, uh, of many Qurans in the early phase to give a the appearance of one Quran. There was always one Quran. Likewise, we get <clears throat> the uh, usage of Islam in a lot of different versions and sects throughout these centuries by multiple state actors, Ottomans, sult you know, Sultan uh, uh, rulers, and so forth, the Seljuk Turks, and. What happens is that this takes on a lot of different forms, but it's very useful, especially to certain of the uh, Ismaili sects. For example, in Israari, I did a video many years, or maybe a, maybe a year ago, uh, on the assassins, the Hashashim, and, and their techniques for uh, training assassins and using things like uh, high-powered drugs, um, hashish, to dupe young guys into thinking that, well, if you, basically they would drug them, uh, show him this little garden of paradise that uh, the very cunning leader had had created. There would be virgins and wine and food. And while these guys are basically uh, tripping balls, when they come down, he says, aha, you see, I've taken you to paradise. Uh, and if you become an assassin for me, this is your this is your afterlife, right? It's a freak off in the afterlife. <laughs> and so uh, that obviously is an early version of mind control and the creation of a kind of an assassin. But that's just one example of the variations that we see. Um, I would say the same thing goes along with the late, uh, early medieval uses of the, the Templars. Uh, we get the Templars who you might think, well, aren't they the enemy of the, the Muslims and the assassins? Well, <clears throat> something happens with the Templars. We don't exactly know what in the Middle Ages, but they at some point become um, entranced with something beyond uh, Christianity or papal Christianity. If you uh, look at great historical texts, uh, there's a good book that I recommend uh, from Papadakis and Meyendorf. This is a newly produced historical text covering the Middle Ages, um, and it discusses early on that you get the Gregorian papal reforms in the 1100s in the West, and what that does is really changes the structure of the church. You get a new ecclesiology where the, pap the, the papacy, the pope, kind of, kind of calls the shots on everything. 
Uh, he's above all the world rulers. He's above every emperor. Every emperor must sub submit to him. He can call standing armies. We see this with the Borgia popes. Um, he can uh, excommunicate anyone that doesn't fight in his armies, as Alexander VI uh, threatens to do. Uh, he has now uh, become basically the Kwisatz Haderach. He's the god emperor. And uh, at the same time, you get these secret orders of warrior monks. Now, in earlier Christian canon law or church law, for example, the Council of Chalcedon, you have canons that say that people who choose a monastic style of life to renounce the world, they can't be uh, a functionaries of the state. They're not supposed to be. They can't go into battle. They can't do this kind of stuff. Uh, and yet we have the papacy saying uh, in this uh, 11th century in the Gregorian reforms, no, I'm going to have warrior monks now. I'm going to have essentially secret society networks that will fight for me against this or that person or this or that enemy. Uh, the problem is that this then creates the the pattern for secret society networks. And I'm not trying to lay all the blame on the papacy. I think other groups were involved as well. There were other groups with secret society networks. Uh, Muslims had secret society networks. Uh, the rabbinical Jews uh, had different types of secret society, secret networks, and uh, uh, secret teachings as well. And so a lot of different groups have the same type of exoteric Christianity, uh, which is for the masses, and an uh, esoteric inner secret Christianity for those initiated. And the groups that we're talking about, the Knights Hospital or the Templars, these become breeding grounds for these kinds of secret society networks. And we all know that the Templars discovered a lot of, uh, uh, well, we don't know exactly what they discovered, but they stumbled upon the idea of um, usury and, and uh, fractional reserve banking and this kind of stuff. And they gained a lot of power and a lot of wealth. And then they had other people like the papacy and the King of France come after them uh, in the 1300s at the Council of Vienne. So that's where they're accused, for example, of being uh, Gnostic heretics. Now, whether they were really into kissing the butt of uh, uh, Satan and worshiping the head of a cat or whatever they're claimed to be uh, involved in. I don't know if that is the case. I know that interestingly, the Vatican, I think uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, supposedly uh, apologized to the Templars. But what's fascinating is that the Templars do continue their tradition uh, that seems to more and more focus on odd things like worldly power, geopolitics, uh, again, secret society type networks, and the the radical devotion to Mary beyond what most Christianity prior to that had seen as normative. For example, if you look at uh, famous paintings in relation to the character of Bernard of Clairvaux, he was one of the founders, I think, of the Cistercians and the, the, the monastic orders uh, uh, related to fighting in the Crusades. Some of the warrior monks looked to Bernard of Clairvaux. You'll find these bizarre paintings of Mary uh, and milk coming out of her breast into the mouth of Bernard. I think all of this is, again, a lot of weird Gnostic um, tendencies that we're seeing in the Latin West, uh, again, through these sort of secret society networks that were sort of the direct armies of the papacy at the time. This is why we get, yeah, there we go. Um, I don't know if you see the the, the the squirting milk teat picture there, but it's it's a famous picture of Bernard. <laughs> but it expresses what we're talking about. And uh, you get the same types of tendencies in the Renaissance papacy and their focus on a lot of alchemy and hermeticism and what is really Neoplatonic uh, philosophy and not really Christianity. Again, I'm not laying all the blame on the papacy. There's a lot of players, a lot of uh, uh, people involved in this, but these are examples of Christianity or religious ideas deviating off into weird pseudo-Gnostic hermetic traditions. And it's always tied with these secret society networks operating in the underground, because at this time there was a lot of legal uh, prohibitions on people exercising, say, witchcraft in public or exercising sorcery in public. Yeah, there's the, uh, the squirting teat image there, which is, again, very odd. <clears throat> I don't think any, any, no, this would never be seen in any, any Orthodox church, but uh, this is this Renaissance period uh, uh, when, again, things are getting a little weird in the West, and we get a lot of hermetic artwork. Uh, I used to think that you know, when Dan Brown came out with his book, which I think is ridiculous, but, you know, I remember thinking that, oh, there's no hermetic artwork in the Vatican. That's that's ridiculous. Well, it turns out, uh, no, actually, Rome has quite a bit of hermetic and alchemical and neoplatonic art. And it's not so much actually at the Vatican, although Bernini did utilize this uh, geometry and this sort of uh, 
uh, esoteric architecture all through uh, St. Peter's and whatnot. The majority of this is actually over in the Vatican Museum, which is the old Borgia papal apartment. So it's maybe not so much of it's in the Vatican itself or St. Peter's uh, Cathedral, but over uh, in the Vatican Museum. And uh, it's full of really uh, weird, occult, esoteric stuff. And so these secret society networks, these traditions, uh, the, 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 a lot of these ideas, they pass into the Venetian um, um, nobility. A lot of the Venetian uh, power structure uh, utilizes these secret society networks, as well as the idea of um, debt-based currency, usury-based currency. And this is interesting because this has formerly been forbidden in Christendom as a whole. So you weren't supposed to exercise or utilize usury principles uh, in the first thousand years of the Christian Imperium. Uh, Byzantium uh, for a long time forbade usury until the last uh, uh, period before Byzantium fell, they began to accept the use of usury. The Latin West also forbade it until the papacy, I think in the Renaissance, uh, in this around this Borgia Renaissance period, the papacy begins to uh, lighten up and say, no, I, you know, you can, there's cases where we can begin to do this. And this opens the door, really, to uh, the rise of what eventually becomes the Vatican Bank. As we know in Operation Gladio, that becomes the key bank for a lot of black operations, a lot of the deep state. Uh, structure funding things like Gladio, uh, Iran-Contra ties to the Vatican Bank, weapon sales tied to the Vatican Bank, <clears throat> all of this because this is a really s the most secretive bank in the world. That's why you've seen so many uh, banking scandals related famously in mainstream news for the last uh, 30, 40, 50 years to the Vatican Bank. But again, I'm not laying all the blame on the Vatican Bank because there's other players as well. Uh, uh, so a lot of people will lay blame on Jews for a lot of this. But you could never have had usury in the West uh, due to the fact that Jews didn't have a lot of power, even though Jews supported usury. They were not the ones calling the shots throughout the medieval Latin period. So how did we get to this point where usury becomes prominent? Well, it couldn't have happened without the dominant powers in the West, the state power and the Vatican uh, beginning to eventually uh, concede to these things. So. We have to be careful where we lay this blame because it's well known, it's been demonstrated by multiple scholars, that the Vatican is actually the one that changed its position uh, on usury. Now, if we look at the period of the Reformation as we move up into church history in the West, we get a lot of these cults and groups that spin off of the, the abuses of the Latin papal church. And certainly I would agree that a lot of the uh, objections of Luther and Calvin and the reformers were, were legitimate. They had a lot of reason to complain with a lot of superstition, a lot of ignorance amongst the Christian people and nations. There was a lot of uh, abuse uh, of clergy uh, uh, with multiple wives and girlfriends and all kinds of stuff because they were supposedly supposed to be celibate. I mean, a lot of absurd, you know, ridiculous things. Uh, the abuse of indulgences and then the the idea that you could donate to have your temporal sins remitted and then that the Pope can free people from purgatory. A lot of the things that Luther complained about, Martin Luther in the 95 Theses, they're legitimate criticisms. But one thing that happened as a result of the Reformation was this other element of the Reformation that you might or might have heard of called the Radical Reformation. So if we think about the Reformers, we think about Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, there was a whole other group, a whole other branch that the classical reformers of Luther and Calvin actually fought against and had many of them killed. And the radical reformers are the, the sort of the forefathers, you could say, of the Amish, the Mennonites, the Hutterites, which you think, well, they're not very well known. Nobody really cares what Amish and Mennonites are up to unless they're, uh, you know, selling dairy that's not legal according to the state or whatever. Then they're like a terror cell, right? But Really, the Amish Mennonite theology morphs into other things. This is where we begin to get Baptist theology. The Baptists that we know about today in America, and that's a big portion of the evangelicals, they come out of the Anabaptists, who were one of the radical Reformation movements. And so it's interesting to me that we think about classical Reformation theology of the, the, the quote, traditional Presbyterian or Lutheran or Methodist churches, or even the Anglican church, um, they had a close relationship to the state. Uh, Luther, for example, couldn't have had his reformation without 
the support of the German princes because they didn't want to go along with the Pope and his geopolitical power. So there was a lot of state power behind the Reformation. Uh, when we look at the Puritans, right, they attempted to kind of set up a sort of a theocracy, which is another kind of state power type of institution as well. And the point is here is not to say, oh, they're all good, they're all bad. It's just to look at the patterns of history and see how this relates to where we are now with the upcoming so supposed solar eclipse and all these end time speculation and people freaking out and people getting all into the sensationalism of it. And my point is going to be very clearly that a lot of this is used to manipulate to socially engineer people. But the reformers, as we said, are not a monolithic group. You get the radical reformers who are made up of a plethora of kind of oddballs. You have people that are the Quakers and the Shakers. And I think the, <laughs> the Shakers still exist. There's like three people. There's like three old guys in Pennsylvania or somewhere and, and one woman or something. They're like the last of the Shakers, which is a split of the Quakers. I'm sure you've heard of Quaker Oats, right? Uh, and these again, these are all these weird, yeah, here we go. It's a bunch of, uh, uh, of people who thought that, well, Luther and Calvin didn't go far enough. And again, you think, you look at these list of beliefs here, uh, some of them were communistic, some of them were pacifists, some of them believed in a direct speaking of the Holy Spirit, and we didn't really worry about anything to do with tradition or sacraments or baptism, Lord's Supper or the Bible. It's just this inner swelling up where God directly moves me and talks to me. That's a big portion of that group. And that's relevant because I would argue that what we see in America, the delusion part of Christianity, is not so much the classical, quote unquote, Protestant churches. Those are pretty much dying. Uh, they've been sterilized and committed to a plan of death and dying out uh, for many decades, going back to the mainline Protestant churches accepting Rockefeller-funded liberalism since the 20s and 30s. So they, <laughs> they've been confessionally liberal and on the path to the acceptance of sterilization through uh, Skittles marriage, uh, through uh, female, quote, bishops and ministers. Uh, that's all a path to sterilization. And the statistics actually bear this out. Most of those mainline Protestant churches are projected to die out in the next 20, 30, 40 years, uh, because they're not reproducing, they're not making converts, they're really just uh, boomers and people that are attached to that tradition for whatever reason. And so the mainline Lutherans, for example, I think are projected to die out in 20, 30, 40 years. And so this is the consequence of those churches becoming controlled and, and manipulated and steered by powerful entities like the Rockefeller Foundation, foundations that give millions of dollars to decide who will be in their seminary. Actually true, in fact, more often than not, it's against the fact of what's the case or what's true. And that's again for the benefit of the state. Now we're working our way up through church history and we're talking about the Protestants, we're talking about the Anabaptists, the Radical Reformation, and how that's overlooked as a really powerful influence in America, because with the death of a lot of a lot of the main line, what we call classical Protestant churches from Luther and Calvin and the Methodists of John Wesley and those numbers declining, what ends up being the majority of so-called Christianity in America is a lot of the Protestant, or excuse me, a lot of the evangelical and charismatic groups. And I'm not trying to go after or hurt anybody's feelings here, but I do have to point out that what often goes along with a lot of these groups is the idea of an early, imminent, a, a soon coming return of Christ preceded by a rapture. And the problem with the rapture doctrine is number one, if we look at the history of the church and the, the church that, for example, put the Bible together in the first seven centuries of Christianity, nobody ever taught the doctrine of a quote, pre-tribulation rapture. This is actually a, an idea that was invented. Some say it was some Jesuit, I'm not sure I believe that, but it really goes along with what we call dispensationalism. And dispensationalism is a heresy that pops up in the late 1800s, promoted by a guy who split from the Church of England uh, and was part of a denomination called the Plymouth Brethren. And his name was John Nelson Darby. And Darby came up with this idea of kind of charting out the history of prophecy and coming up with these different divisions in church history and that God had different plans and ways to save people in different ways. So in the Old Testament, you'd be saved with certain types of works. But now that Jesus came, it's all about grace. And 
there's grace as a set in attention against works and uh, now we can be saved uh, in, in a different way but then when jesus comes back there'll be a new temple and he'll reinstitute animal sacrifices and we'll get uh, a thousand year reign of jesus in israel and all of this sort of ridiculous nonsense which is not true in fact this is a huge delusion and it's a delusion because number one the rapture is an idea that's intended to cause you to sit back and wait and actually want the antichrist to come so rather than taking action and rather than being involved christians uh, are are basically pacified and emasculated by thinking that well there's no point because everything is destined to become uh, really, really bad, and it'll, things never get better. And so we might as well just concede to wickedness and become, I don't know, some sort of some weird version of black pill. But when Paul talks about being caught up in the clouds in his letter to the Thessalonians, there's no reason to think that this is any different than the second coming and the general resurrection of all mankind. And that was always what Christianity taught. So if that's the case, and if it's not really, if, if the, the so-called basis for, for the pre-tribulation rapture is very flimsy, like John in the book of Revelation being caught up to see the visions. Oh, that's gonna, that's a telling us about the rapture of the Christians before the tribulation. No, John is seeing those events in his day. Okay, this is prior to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So if John is seeing things that were contemporary and events that were gonna happen to the people he was writing to, remember he writes to seven actual churches in Asia Minor. And he warns those actual churches about events that they're going to experience. Okay, What use would it be to them if it's events that are 2,000 years later? I'm not saying that there's no application to the end of the world in the book of Revelation. I'm just saying that it's out of the context of who he's writing to. But the real issue here is not even that. It's, well, then what's the point of the rapture doctrine and the idea of, say, evangelical Zionism and so forth? Where does this come from? Well, as I said, you got these people at Oxford, Cambridge, people uh, in these elite British circles who happen to be also connected oftentimes to the idea of British Israelite theology. And if you don't know what that is, that's a weird idea that the 10 lost tribes in the Old Testament somehow might be people in uh, Europe or perhaps uh, the Scottish or the English. They're part of these lost tribes. And who even knows if that's true? But this theory also plays into the idea that uh, you find in a lot of European nobility and uh, uh, regal traditions that the Merovingians are the descendants of Jesus somehow, or that the uh, British kings and queens descend from uh, you know Joseph of Arimathea, right? Now, they actually do kind of have this mythology there. I think it's complete nonsense, but I think they use this myth as a kind of way to prop up their status beliefs. And obviously, uh, if you believe that the British Isles and the peoples are a lost tribe of Israel, you can then begin to appropriate the promises uh, to Israel or Jews to you, and it becomes this ridiculous sort of self-propagating uh, um, backing up of the state. And it's really an Anglo version of Hebrew Israelite theology, right? Which is absurd, and it's like, no, no, the real Jews are uh, random black people. Okay? I'm not trying to be mean to anybody, but there was a meme going around Twitter and it was various rappers and people saying, look, here's the icons from the 1400s out of Russia. And look, it's Jesus is black. No, sorry, Jesus was a Jew. He wasn't a black guy. Nothing against black guys. Jesus, even being a Jew, can still save anybody. <laughs> right? So, that's, But he has to be a Hebrew to fulfill the messianic prophecies, right? So you can't be the Messiah and not be in the lineage of Abraham, David, etc. Okay, you got to be, and so it's not going to be a dude in Numidia or a dude in Africa. So Jesus has to be a Jew, has to be a Hebrew to fulfill the prophecies, right? And that's why the Gospels, for example, include the genealogies. If there were, if, if it didn't matter, then they wouldn't have genealogies. Well, the genealogies show that he's a descendant of Abraham and David. Anyway. Uh, the point, though, with the rapture and dispensationalism and this idea of chopping up church history and the interjection of the premillennial uh, uh, and pre-tribulation, the premillennial idea of the uh, the kingdom, the introduction of the uh, pre-tribulation rapture, this is really a neutralizing, emasculating fact, effect on Christianity. It's a heresy because it's a completely new, made-up teaching. It was never in the church uh, prior to that time of 
uh, John Nelson Darby. But it's more than that because this odd sort of not well-known belief uh, in the mid to late 1800s gets popularized by a guy who creates a study Bible, and his name is Schofield. The Schofield Study Bible is produced by Oxford. Isn't it interesting? Why would Oxford University publish this bizarre fringe idea of end time stuff study Bible that gets heavily promoted in America as soon as it's published after Schofield puts it together? Well, I can tell you why. The British Empire had a goal, had a strategy, because they knew via the Balfour Declaration that number one, the establishment of the state of Israel was soon to come. This dispensationalist minded study Bible would then inculcate America and the West, particularly evangelicals and Protestants, with a lot of these new ideas and new teachings, which kind of ultimately, it's not their only point, but it ultimately served to back up the reestablishment of the nation state of Israel, as if that was the fulfillment of some sort of end times prophecy. So this was an engineered thing in my view. I'm not saying that there won't be end times uh, stuff relating to Israel, and I'm not saying that Israel doesn't play any kind of role in the end times. I'm not saying any of that, I'm just saying that if you look at the actual history of why they promoted the uh, Schofield Study Bible and why it was so popular in American evangelical circles, it's really the source of why America became a, an evangelical Zionist promoting thing. So whether you think that's right or wrong, I'm saying that that seems to be how it came about. And the problem here is that now, the um, just like we saw, for example, with Puritans, if you read the Puritans the way they speak of America, the Puritans viewed America like it was the church, right? And the, the American Constitution or, or the city on a hill, like the, that's the church. If you're an evangelical Zionist, there's not, you're not really concerned with the church. You actually believe in Israel more than the church. So that's now your sort of focus of everything. And the point is that it takes the, the position, it takes the focus away from the Messiah. We'll be back after this break. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm guest host Jay Dyer of Jay's Analysis. And we're talking about the usage of a lot of groups, sects, cults to promote various deep state power agendas. And we were talking about dispensationalism and end time stuff. And I wanted to uh, close on that point and move on to some other uh, things related to the eclipse and speculations about that and pointing out that, uh, so when you get the establishment of the nation state of Israel, uh, you get a period where many Jews do want to return and immigrate there. And when Hitler comes to power, the British actually ended up screwing over the Jews because they want they gave the impression that they wanted this to be the case. They wanted to have people uh, immigrate and to leave, and yet they then revoked the ability of many Jews to actually immigrate. And this led to Hitler being able to persecute many Jews. And Hitler, as we know, in my view, if you read Tragedy and Hope, uh, there's multiple pages uh, in, in uh, Dr. Gerald Quigley's text where he talks about, for example, in 1930, I think it's 39, uh, Hitler was given $2 billion in gold, Czechoslovakian gold, from the Bank of England. And this had to do with their dual policy where they were, the British were on the one hand, wanting Hitler to go to war and to engage in these uh, atrocities and whatnot and to cause World War II, yet at the same time uh, telling the public that they were opposed to Hitler uh, uh, actually screwing over the Jews. And this is what led to the rise of the Irgun and the opposition to the British mandate on the part of the existing Jews in Israel. That led then to the bombing of the King David Hotel. Anyway, I I don't have any position on any of that necessarily applying to, quote, prophecy. I'm just pointing out that it's a really complicated history. And then you get the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem who comes in and says that this is actually going to now be an entirely purely Arab Palestine. And the problem is that the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem was actually an uh, agent of British intelligence. So we constantly see throughout this period a kind of maybe an inner struggle within the British power structure who was trying to play both sides of all these conflicts. They tried to play both sides of the uh, of the partitioning uh, of of the land of Palestine into uh, uh, Israel and into Palestine. And a lot of the uh, elites of the British were had this bizarre obsession and fascination with Islam. And I think that had to do with their imperial period when people like uh, St. John Philby and uh, T. E. Lawrence, and the, they went to become kind of immersed in the the Arab tribes to uh, figure out how to best rule them 
uh, in an imperial way. You can watch the the Peter O'Toole movie, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, where you see this in the in the film. So interestingly, many of the British aristocracy and elite were uh, Philo uh, Arabists. They loved uh, they loved Islam and Arabic culture. I'm not saying they were all Muslims. I'm just saying that many of them were on the side of this. Some of them, however, were not. Some of them were more on the side of uh, the establishment of a Zionist state, like Lord Rothschild and others. So there might have even been in the in the power structure in in Britain at this time, uh, per- perhaps an inner struggle. But regardless, it, uh, overall, it looks like they were trying to play both sides of this issue. And that doesn't really have anything to do, though, with, in my view, with necessarily, quote, prophecies. But the danger is that because of the uh, nation state of Israel being set up and because of the recent wars, I'm not saying take any size. I'm just saying that the, the point here is that pr- prophecy people will go nuts over this. And we already see it. And oh, the red heifer and this and that. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to talk about this, but I've been hearing the stories of the red heifer since the 90s. And, and it's always this sort of like, oh, the, uh, this is happening in the rapture. And then, the you know, and none of that ever manifests. It may this time, it, it could. I'm, again, I'm not trying to be a know it all. But, you know, when you hear the same types of warnings and fear and threats and anxiety from this kind of you know, John Hagee in times, blood moons type of stuff. The blood moons of Israel. And by the way, Jesus isn't the Messiah. If you don't remember, he actually wrote a book called Jesus Isn't the Messiah based on his dispensationalism. I think he had to retract that book. But this gives you an idea of where the sort of John Hagee type characters are coming from. And if you remember, Hal Lindsey wrote a book, for example, saying that he thought the rapture would come in 1988 based on these goofy charts that he had come up with. And if I recall, I did an interview with a friend of mine uh, many years ago who had done a deep dive into that. And I think Hal Lindsey to the profits of that book and bought a bunch of real estate in Malibu. <laughs> so clearly he didn't think the rapture was coming. A lot of other groups and sects like Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, have uh, predicted the end of the world multiple times. And when it doesn't happen, uh, shocker, uh, uh, judge, judge somebody, I forget, forget his name, but one of the, the prominent Jehovah's Witness leaders after Charles Taze Russell, uh, he also uh, bought uh, Beth Serum, this uh, pretty I mean, I wouldn't say it's a mansion, but it's a nice multi-million dollar house in San Diego after his end times prediction didn't work out and all of his uh, followers gave him their money and he ended up buying a pad in San Diego. Um, So we see this pattern a lot with cults and sects who utilize the fear and the sensationalism of end times prophecies and predictions. And we think about back to Y2K. I mean, I was I was still, I think, kind of an evangelical minded person and in the in in 2k i was kind of starting to have some doubts about evangelicalism at that time but i remember thinking that oh you know the media was hyping this up it's gonna be the end of the world there's gonna be uh everything collapsing uh, society's gonna collapse because the clocks on the computers won't flip over right or whatever i mean it was kind of silly but the media hyped it up and everybody kind of generally thought that it might be some big deal it ended up not being a big deal uh and then if you think about through the 2000s we had so many inflated terror warnings, right? Oh, it's orange level terror. You know, we were talking about this on the the uh, stream with the Alex last night and Jack Posobiec and, um, and non-Elon Musk Dittman. Uh, so it was a wild conversation that we had. If you hadn't watched that, go watch that on a band video. And, uh, you know, then we had uh, in 2014-ish, I remember there being a full solar collapse. And, excuse me, uh, eclipse, not a collapse. I remember going outside and, and you know, it was dusk. It was really cool. Like Alex was saying the other day, it's like the, the birds get quiet. And I don't know, it looks like uh, a filter from Blade Runner is put over your, your visual uh, <laughs> array. I don't know, but it was kind of cool. It lasted for maybe 10 minutes and then at five minutes it was gone. Um, so I don't understand how this one would be any different than that one. Nothing happened in that one. And at the time, a lot of people were saying, oh, it's the end of the world. Blah, blah. If you've listened to alternative conspiracy radio or whatever for a long time, uh, Planet X, Planet X is going to collide with us and this and that. All of these fear scenarios end up ultimately never manifesting. They're ridiculous. And there's so many more that we could talk about. A lot of the time, what I think is going on is that most of the time these are attempts to get people agitated and in a state of constant anxiety and being kind of all kilter, then you're more likely to default to the system. And the whole 
point of the war on terror was that, to get everybody constantly afraid of everything and not afraid of the real things. So you're you're focused on distracted with these absurd things, blood moons and, and Ebola. In, and, and again, remember Ebola, nothing happened in 2014. They were saying Ebola was into the world, but Ebola is coming to America from Africa. Nothing happened. So you notice the pattern here of the media does the same thing that the goofy evangelical end times predictors do, right? Harold Camping, he would constantly predict the rapture and the end of the world. And every time it didn't happen, he would just update his prediction and say, oh, well, I've miscalculated. And by the way, uh, or like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they would say, oh, it was a spiritual event that occurred. And you couldn't see it, but it really did happen, right? This is con artistry. These are con men. The same stuff with aliens. There, there aren't extra biological aliens. I'm sorry. There's no evidence of this. There's a lot of weird stuff in the sky. But how does that lead us to the conclusion that there's visitors from the Pleiades? Where's the heart of it? I mean, maybe there are entities, but maybe they're demons. Like, what's the what's the basis for it being some thing that flew here from the Pleiades just to, uh, you know, molest people and touch butts, uh, whatever the aliens do with their with their intrusions into various orifices? So this is a lot of conspiracy candy. It's a lot of uh, causing anxiety, getting you hyped up, paranoid awareness. Social engineers study this. In fact. Cass Sunstein, who was Obama's, uh, one of his czars, who went on to the NSA, he wrote a famous paper, as I mentioned, about cognitive infiltration. And this paper was discussing the way to infiltrate truth movements, people that do real research, come up with real information, and to seed it with fake conspiracies, just flood it with dumb, fake conspiracies. Get people arguing over things that don't even matter or you can't even know. Tartario, there was an ancient civilization of mud flooding. I mean, maybe, but like, how are you? You're not going to prove this. What's this going to do? It's it's not, you know, it's not like understanding the Federal Reserve, right? And the solution to that being buying Bitcoin, right? So there's all these fake conspiracies to distract from the real things going on. And the government wants you involved in those things. The government, the system, they actually love fake conspiracies. And it's a form of religious engineering, no different than the high priests in Apocalypto who are duping everybody into thinking that they have to sacrifice 10,000 people and worship the state or the sun won't come back. Just go watch Mel Gibson's Apocalypto. So anyway, that's my take on it. If you want to support my work, you can go to my website, jaysanalysis.com and get the books in the, in the shop, sign copies of my